by uh, welcoming you all very warmly to Congress House and to the TUC's ninth annual Climate Change Conference. Each of the last three decades has been successively warmer at the Earth's surface than any preceding decade since 1850. So the theme of our conference today, there can be no turning back from tackling this most fundamental challenge to human society. Delegates, energy and climate issues have rarely been out of the headlines in the past few weeks. And we've been presented with two very clear political alternatives. Last month, Ed Miliband led the way with his conference speech, promising a 20-month freeze on electricity and gas bills if Labour wins the election. A welcome challenge to price hikes at a time when real pay is being cut and a bold intervention to shape the market for the future. There was an immediate response from the government and the big six energy firms who claimed that such a move would starve infrastructure of investment. Some people felt that was a bit rich because let's face it, they've been taking an investment holiday for decades. And so inevitably, I'm delighted to be back into government to uh, attempt to give some impetus to what I believe is the single biggest diplomatic challenge of our time, uh, managing to get political consensus around the world to manage this problem, and no less than that is required because of the magnitude of the problem. Now, we, we do have uh, Julia Slingo coming on after me, and Julia will explain, I'm sure, the, the science to you uh, very well. I just want to really draw your attention to a few issues. This May, the measurements at Mauna Loa in Hawaii, long-term measurements of carbon dioxide, uh, passed 400 parts per million by volume. So why was this, in a sense, an iconic moment? What is it about 400? Well, to understand that, let's look at the past climate record, going back 800,000 years from the Vostok ice cores, Epica ice cores. Two graphs here. The upper graph shows the concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over those geological times. And the lower graph shows what we think the temperature was uh, relative to the last thousand years. And what you see is what one can almost think of as the heartbeat of the planet in responses to changes in the planet's orbit around the sun. The very first program I began in that new foresight process was on risk and flood management for the UK. And it took three years. We had 120 experts reporting. The results of their analysis was because of rising sea levels and changing patterns of rainfall in the UK across the country, flood was the greatest risk that we faced as a country from the impacts of climate change. And the risk was so severe that we had the Association of British Insurers representing all the insurance industry backing us up to the hilt. We are currently in a planet with relatively little ice. And that is an important part of understanding what climate, future climate change may mean to us. I also want you to look at the scale between a glacial and an interglacial is at most 10 degrees. And we are talking, uh, or have been talking, of climate change in the next 100 years of four, six degrees. And people think those are small numbers, but they're not when you understand that going from a, glac a glacial state to an interglacial, we're only talking 10 degrees. And what of the Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, Owen Patterson? He had already called for cuts to subsidies given to wind farms and green energy projects. Then he went further and told a Conservative Party fringe event that global warming had a positive side. But then again, what do you expect from a man who is pro-fox hunting, who is anti-gay marriage, and who justified the extension of the Badger coal trials by accusing the Badgers of moving the goalposts? <laughs> So that even when we look at how rapidly carbon dioxide has changed here in response, in this case, to temperature, 
this is happening has happened in the space of barely just a bit more than a century. And the ability of the climate system to adjust to that change and for natural ecosystems to adjust to that change is for sure being compromised. It seems to me that we're making a number of mistakes with regard to different technologies. Uh, with renewables, um, we actually pioneered a lot of the technology for wind uh, and then decided we didn't want to pursue it back in the 70s and early 80s. That was a catastrophic mistake. We're now making another by refusing to set in legislation a decarbonisation target, which would do more than anything to help bring down the cost of offshore wind in particular, which is an expensive technology, but an absolutely essential one. Something is absolutely not right when a quarter of UK households struggle to pay their energy bills, but energy company profits have increased by 74% in the last four years, and they're still putting their prices up, as we all know. Something's not right when the government's own independent advisers say that remaining hooked on fossil fuels will mean even higher energy bills in the future than if we go renewable, yet the government is promoting policies which will precisely keep us hooked on fossil fuels. I think we need more grassroots activism and, and grassroots organising to really push for these radical agendas. I think green growth is a problematic term, and maybe it's because the idea of growth has been quite bastardised. And I think we need to be careful as trade unionists about what direction we're going. You know, are we going for a, a slow green, or we, we try to reduce climate change a little bit, or do we need a more radical approach? Because climate change is happening right now. The government has um, taken the view, uh, at last, that it wishes to uh, promote nuclear energy uh, and um, to support it in, in that kind of way. That means, really, for us, uh, a great expansion in construction jobs, uh, in-house jobs when the uh, power station is built, but much more importantly, allows for the future of nuclear development again within this country. Never in modern times have so many young people had so little confidence in our establishment, our institutions, our politics, across all the parties. They don't knock, knock on doors for political parties. They don't join them. They don't vote, don't trust politicians. Our new just struggle as we stand at this threshold will be the struggle to restore the contract between generations. And that, you may have been wondering by now, that is where climate change comes in. Because a contract that doesn't include fixing the climate will not, as we've already heard, be a contract worth having. Today's announcement from NPower and the timing of the bill increase, I think is particularly cruel for those companies' customers. First of December, ladies and gentlemen, the start of Advent, when kids get really excited about Christmas and they open the first door on their Advent calendar. Now this year, for families up and down the country, it's not which Christmas present to buy for my children, but which room do I hate? The TUC is already in the vanguard, and there has been no stronger voice for that renewal in recent years, no individual champion more committed and persuasive than Francis. You have the high ground, but now please reach out from there and help build the coalition we need. We can't write the manifesto today, but here's a foretaste of what might be in it. A manifesto to put Britain and keep Britain in the front rank of the inevitable global shift to a low carbon economy. Francis mentioned how decarbonisation shouldn't mean deindustrialisation. If anything, it should mean reindustrialization, seeing revitalized, vibrant, and innovative industries providing jobs and prosperity in every part of this country. Remember that the Stern Report famously said that climate change was the biggest case of market failure in human history. To those who say this is politically naive or economically unrealistic, I want to end with this. Look at what other countries are doing. Look at how Germany has nurtured a successful green economy. Delegates, don't let anyone sell Britain short. Our green economy is already worth around £120 billion. It accounts for nearly a million jobs and it's in trade surplus. But it could be so much bigger, so much better. We have the workforce, the scientific know-how, the creativity to lead the world in green economics by 2020. All it needs is the political will to make it happen. 
a just transition to a dynamic, low-carbon future can be within our grasp, delivering not just new jobs and industries to the communities that need them most, but new hope too. As unions, we have to lead from the front and make the case for progressive change. It's about justice, equality, and sustainability, working collectively to make life better for everyone, creating those new jobs, growing new industries, and safeguarding our planet for generations to come. Thank you very much for listening.